I'm hoping to just add depth and detail to what uh, Fawn provided this morning in terms of a little bit understanding of the nitty gritties um, behind those numbers with methodology and some more detail. Uh, as she outlined, we have three parts of this, the environmental, social and economic assessments. And we're going to go really fast, guys, because we've got lots of material to cover. <laughs> and uh, I will tell you, there is a summary strategy that's available on the tables out in the hallways. There's also factoids. So if I've gotten it wrong, it's probably right in the document. <laughs> so go check that first. Um, but we had a really uh, comprehensive process that we went over over two, of a, two and a half years with multi-stakeholders. We had a steering committee. We had a third-party critical review panel. And we consulted experts uh, continuously along the way to make sure that we had the most current and robust information and data that was very specific to Canada and wanting to find all of those different sources of information. Uh, starting with uh, the national statistics from the Census of Agriculture uh, and then supplementing with more detail from the literature reviews as well as the surveys. And as noted, we wanted to not just look at the negatives that come out from the impact from a life cycle assessment on the environmental side. We also wanted to look at land use, recognizing that the beef industry and cattle on the landscape have a really important role to play in terms of ecosystem function, whether we're talking about mineral cycling, water cycling, or any of those pieces, and the contribution that the beef industry plays there. We did a farm survey, and we had 77 farms contribute to the environmental survey with over 250,000 head, uh, with representation across the country in most provinces, uh, and then all across the value chain from cow-calf right through to finishing. And we've got functional units, and we're presenting the results um, in the kilograms per live weight because that makes the most sense for the farmers in terms of what is their contribution. But we also wanted to recognize that this study goes from farm to fork, and so our presenting those results is a kilogram of packed boneless beef delivered and consumed right to that customer and what the impact is for those consumers who are concerned about the environmental impact that their um, eating habits have. So for that climate change number that funds already presented, 11.4 kilograms uh, of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of live weight, 74% of that comes from the farm, with the main contributors being your enteric methane uh, from your rumen digestion, your feed production, and then your manure. We've got fossil depletion at 0.6 kilograms of oil equivalent per kilogram of live weight at the farm gate, with most of this coming from that feed production aspect and getting that crop off into the animal. Water, uh, this is a blue water number, so we're not looking at gray or green water. Um, and it's 631 liters of blue water per kilogram uh, boneless or 235 liters uh, live weight. And really it's the irrigation that's the big part of this number with irrigation representing 80% of that impact at the farming level with 19% being your drinking water and 1% being your other. Uh, our number is smaller than some other countries because we have a smaller amount of irrigation in Canada. We've got about 54,000 hectares um, of cropland that is ex estimated to be used for beef uh, feed in the provinces of Alberta, BC, and Saskatchewan. And the use of our irrigation water is estimated to be about 16% of total irrigation water uh, in Canada. And so one of the questions earlier had been, how are we going to improve on these numbers? How are we going to reduce our water footprint? And when you're recognizing that this number comes primarily from irrigation, is there ways that we can improve efficiency in our irrigation? Can we go from flood irrigation, which is relatively inefficient way of providing water, to pivots or some other technology that is... Um, more efficient in the use of that water and uptake of the plant. 
one of the questions was earlier mentioned was our comparison of water, and we've got to be really careful when we compare some of these numbers statistically because some of them cannot be compared. Um, our number is a gross blue water footprint number, and you can see our numbers there with the different values um, in terms of a functional unit and comparisons with other countries. But we want to be careful that we're not comparing against the numbers that come out from the water footprint network, which are actually a net number. Um, so a lot of producers say, yes, we use water, but that water cycles. Um, and we recognize that, and the methodologies recognize that as well. So our number is that gross number, not taking into account that cycling, whereas that net water recognizes um, that you've got that water cycling going on. So our numbers uh, are not comparable to those. We want to recognize that we've got the potential for water pollution with both phosphorus as well as nitrogen. And these are potentials. Uh, we do recognize that uh, we produce livestock in some of the drier regions um, in Canada, and the water risk assessment did recognize that. But there is potential for water to be uh, moving and those nutrients to be going off of the landscape. Um, so we've got fresh water eutrophication at 5.8 kilograms of phosphorus equivalent per kilogram of live weight at the farm gate and uh, marine eutrophication at 76 grams of nitrogen equivalent per kilogram of live weight. And this is actually an area where we're looking to get more research done um, in terms of erosion levels in Canada um, and getting some more specific Canadian data uh, to make these more robust when we go back um, and and update these numbers. So food waste, uh, for every kilogram of boneless beef consumed, it takes about 1.24 kilograms of edible meat to be produced. And that waste is things like shrink, dressing percentage, uh, processing, um, all of those things. And then when you get to consumption, that's your plate waste. Um, and this is an area where you can see that that plate waste is actually double what happens in processing and retail. And there is an a, actually active aspect that consumers can be playing in terms of reducing the impact of waste. Um, with reducing beef waste by 50%, we could avoid the release of 1.6 metric tons of um, CO2 equivalent per year and save up to 31 billion liters of water. Um, so this is a really big area um, that a lot of work could be done in and a lot of communication. So moving on to land use, uh, one of the first things that we needed to do with land use, uh, and Daniela mentioned it, is we need to know what our footprint and what land are we actually using out there. And this is where the surveys came into place. Um, we, uh, this, you're not supposed to be able to read this. Um, this is just for the effect of knowing the diversity of the rations. And that diversity comes from the fact that we've got rations in the east and in the west, uh, corn-based versus barley-based. But you can also see throughout our production system, we've got a lot of diversity um, right through our, the beef chain. And so what we did is we took all of these rations and said, okay, if this is how many tons of each feed type is needed given yields in each province, how many acres of each land type are required to support the beef industry. And that gave us a base of um, 21 uh, million hectares uh, of uh, land required for beef production in Canada, and this is about 33% of agricultural land, with obviously the majority of this being um, pasture that is marginal land, uh, not suitable for uh, annual grain production. Uh, but we do have uh, hay, barley, and other crops, and those represent about 9% of our annual crop and summer follow acres in Canada. And the number at the top there, it takes anywhere between 37 and 93 square meters of land to produce a kilogram of live weight uh, 
beef in Canada, and the wide range, again, comes back to our regional diversity as well as differences in production system. Was this animal calf-fed or yearling-fed? Was it in eastern Canada uh, where they have really high um, productivity on their grassland, or was it somewhere in the short grass prairie of western Canada where we need a little bit more space? But we want to recognize that using this land um, is actually positive. And it's a really important impact uh, for the beef industry. From 1981 to 2001, Canada's agricultural land lost 5% of its capacity to sustain biodiversity, mostly as a result of intensification in eastern Canada. And I want you to think of a growing population and growing city sizes. Um, it's not that land's falling off into the ocean. Uh, while 31% of farmland is pasture in the West, only 9% of farmland is pasture in eastern Canada. And this decline really came from the reduced species richness and suitable habitat for wildlife. Our native rangelands and unimproved pasture provide the highest capacity to sustain biodiversity in agricultural areas. So the main concern for biodiversity is not conversion of forest and wetlands, which has slowed in recent years, but actually loss of native prairie grasslands. And currently less than 20% of Canada's grasslands remain intact, and grasslands are considered an endangered ecosystem. And I grew up in southwest Saskatchewan at the Gateway to Grasslands National Park. And I remember when it was first put into place because it was identified as an endangered ecosystem. That uh, we come from an area where we have lots of space, but that's not always the case in many places. So the disappearance of grasslands has led to an overall loss of 44% of the population's grassland species since 1970, with individual species showing declines of up to 87%, particularly grassland birds. And so conserving grassland species really depends upon a sustainable cattle grazing practices. And the beef industry is really part of the solution uh, for those concerns. And so we need to recognize that biodiversity is a really complex issue. We've got a lot of green things up there, noting how it is a positive impact on the landscape, but we also have a lot of negatives up there as well. And that's where we need to recognize that having healthy rangelands is important, and the stewardship and management by beef producers contributes to that. And we really wanted something that was national in scope, and Daniela's group is looking at Alberta um, because they have a lot more detailed data available in Alberta. But in order to do our assessment, we recognized that it was the Canadian Roundtable of Sustainable Beef doing this, and we wanted something that was Canadian. And so we went to Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, who has a wildlife habitat capacity for farmland indicators. And so this is the WAFI index, and it's a habitat suitability model with 587 species of wild terrestrial vertebrates um, in four different taxonomic groups of mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles. And it really goes down into that 30-meter square grid um, and classifies the suitability of that habitat in terms of is it a primary habitat, is it secondary, is it tertiary, or is it simply unsuitable for that animal. Uh, Deloitte, um, who did the study for us, went on and uh, worked with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada to um, make, sort of customize this for the beef industry. And what they did is they used average habitat values for breeding and feeding um, for each polygon level and so that we could actually see what is the beef industry's contribution to supporting this wildlife habitat. And you can see that habitats vary in their usefulness. And right at the top, we've got wetlands and grasslands. And then about middle of the way, we've got pastures and forages. And those are some of the main ones that the beef industry uses and contributes to um, stewarding. And we do want to recognize, and the steering committee noted, that the results from this index are actually conservative. Because of the scale that it's done at, uh, wetlands and pastures tend to be excluded 
um, in terms of being allocated to the beef industry. And so if we were able to be at a scale that we could include those as being supported and stewarded by beef producers, it would actually be potentially higher. So the results as noted, while we um, need 33% of Canada's agricultural land for beef production, that is supporting 68% of the total habitat capacity index in Canada. And so it's a really important uh, for wildlife. In terms of carbon sequestration, uh, they looked at average stocks of carbon per land use type, and you can see that um, you've got an average uh, carbon stock per hectare for cropland of about 76, um, and this is metric tons, I believe. And then for improved pasture, 71, and unimproved pasture, 74. But I just want to point out the diversity. When you look across the country, you've got some provinces that have higher carbon stocks and some that have lower. Um, this is going to depend on your soil type as well as your rainfall and other aspects. But we've got 1.5 billion tons of carbon stored in lands used by beef producers thanks to soil carbon sequestration. This one's actually really interesting because we talked earlier about carbon emissions at the 11.4 kilograms of carbon equivalent for live, per kilogram of live weight. But because we're sequestering carbon into the soil um, each year in that land, it actually reduces the, those emissions by 8% um, down to 10.5 kilograms once you take that into account. So our social assessment was done with a survey of 76 farms, and about half of these were the same farms that had done the environmental assessment, and the other half were farms that just did the social assessment. We also did surveyed nine associations, both provincial associations and two national associations, as well as our packing industry with representation from over 80% of our um, packers and processors. And as Fawn noted, uh, we had um, some really great results here and a couple of areas uh, that were identified as at risk. In terms of animal care, you can see that uh, the majority of them, uh, those first two blocks, were identified as being very low risk or low risk. Um, and overall, 96% of the animal welfare indicators were low or very low. Uh, with none being identified as high risk. Economic sustainability, and um, this is actually my area. Uh, I'm an economist, I'm not an environmentalist or a scientist. Uh, so I could talk all day about this, but I've only got like two minutes, so we're going to fly through it. Um, but we def defined economic sustainability as the ability of a system to maintain productivity in the face of a major disturbance, like a border closure, um, as well as slow shifts in consumer preferences. And I think right now when we talk about the urgency for sustainability, it's really those slow shifts in consumer preferences. And is the industry responding to them? And this is the importance of that price signal, because the price signal is what connects the producer to the consumer, and it tells us what to produce more of and what to produce less of. And that's where when we talk about premiums, it's one where you either need a premium to tell you to produce more of a certain attribute, or it's simply the baseline of what's expected and anyone who doesn't provide that is going to be discounted. Those are really your only two options. Um, but when we looked at this, our biggest challenge in terms of economic sustainability is declining terms of trade. And that simply means that over time, historically, we've seen production increase faster than uh, demand. And that's seen declining real prices. And that's the pressure we've had on our industry. And the response from producers has been to increase productivity so that they can actually be competitive and stay viable. And that's really the irony in that the part of the problem is also the solution. We also note that we have a really distinct cattle cycle in North America and that we've got years um, where producers are going to have negative margins. And so when we look at this, it needs to be over a long period of time and also recognizing that producers need risk management tools available to them to survive those years uh, where we have negative margins. 
So Fawn mentioned um, producer viability, and in 2013, our baseline year, um, we had four typical farms that we were looking at that were covering their short term, that's their cash costs, as well as their medium term depreciation costs. And three out of the four were actually able to cover their long term opportunity costs. Um, opportunity costs is one that is frequently unpaid in agriculture, and that's your unpaid labor. Um, and it, this is one that uh, is challenging to talk about because you may not be paid in cash dollars, but a lot of producers are compensated in some way, whether it's the fact that their house is provided for them um, or their truck is provided for them. I can't tell you how many producers in the last two years bought brand new trucks. Uh, so, so there's compensation that's actually really hard to track and to measure, which is a challenge when we look at economic viability. And there's tremendous diversity in our industry uh, when we can see uh, producers in um, certain environments where because of the environment, if there's lots of rain and it's really cold, they may need housing for those animals and therefore they're really focused on high productivity um, with that. But it doesn't mean that they're not a low cost producer. Um, and similarly, you may have a producer that's in a low productivity environment that's really focused on reducing their cash costs as well as being a low cost producer. So there's no single right way um, for producers to be viable. And consumer resilience, uh, we need a consumer who actually wants to eat beef um, and is interested in eating beef. Uh, but we have had the strongest domestic demand in the last 25 years that we've seen in 2015 and 2016, uh, which is really encouraging as we've seen prices increase that we've got consumers here at home that are willing to pay for it. Uh, but we also have really strong international demand for Canadian product as well, and it has softened in 2016, um, but it's still historically high.